Um, so when you're ready, please go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Bronson. So to those who don't know me, my name is Rowan. I'm a PhD student working at the University of Adelaide with David Huang and Tak He. And today I'm going to be talking about some of my PhD research looking at quantifying the anisotropy in triplet exciton diffusion within crystalline tips pentacene. So to an audience such as AU Chaos, solar power should need no introduction. Solar makes up quite a considerable chunk of our national energy grid, and particularly in my home state of South Australia. And the share of photo photovoltaics in our national energy grid is growing at a remarkable rate. However, single junction photovoltaics, such as the silicon cells that we see everywhere, are fundamentally limited to a maximum possible efficiency of about 30%. Now, this efficiency limit comes from a number of contributing causes, but two of the big ones are due just to an argument from the band gap of a material. So for a single band gap semiconductor, some fraction of the solar spectrum have photons of energy less than this band gap, which can't be absorbed by the semiconductor. On the other hand, photons of energy higher than this band gap can be absorbed, but any energy in excess of that band gap is wasted through rapid thermal relaxation of these excited electrons to the band edge in a process known as thermalization. So solar is a big industry worldwide. And so there are a lot of research in avenues open at the moment into trying to improve solar efficiencies. And two of the big schools of thought use methods of up or down conversion. So in up conversion, we would take two low energy photons that can't be absorbed by our material and combine their energy into one higher energy photon that could be absorbed by our material. The reverse process is down conversion, where we might take one high energy photon, where most of its energy is lost through thermalization, and we would split its energy into two lower energy photons, which are still absorbed by our material, but now you lose much less energy overall through this thermalization process. So in today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on down conversion and one specific method of down conversion known as singlet fission. And no, not that type of singlet fission. The singlet fission that I'm referring to is a spin allowed photophysical process in which a single exciton localized on one chromophore can couple to an adjacent chromophore in its ground state to form two triplet excitons residing on neighboring chromophores. Now this process is spin allowed because it occurs through this correlated triplet pair intermediate state that has overall singlet character. And it's also an energy conserving process. So the energy of each of these triplet excitons is approximately half that of the energy of the original singlet exciton. So within the context of down conversion for, for photovoltaics, an ideal scheme might look something a bit like this, where our singlet fission chromophore would absorb high energy photons and undergo singlet fission to form two lower energy triplet excitons. These triplet excitons would then migrate through our chromophore material to some sort of interface. And at this interface, they would transfer either their electrons or their energy into a harvesting material. Now, in theory, this could improve photovoltaic efficiencies up to about 43%. However, the studies that have been done so far that actually incorporate singlet fission layers into practical devices have seen very minimal efficiency improvements. And there are a few causes for this, but one of the issues is that most of the research in this field so far has only focused on this initial singlet fission step. And there's been very little interest in optimizing these processes of triplet migration and electron or energy transfer. But actually, if we want to make functional effective devices, we need to optimize all of these processes. And so in today's talk, I am gonna be focusing on triplet migration and mobility within singlet fission chromophore materials. And no, not that kind of triplet mobility. I am of course referring to triplet exciton transfer, which occurs via the Dexter mechanism and actually involves an effective two electron transfer between adjacent chromophores. So because this process involves electron transfer, it's a very short range process because it's effectively governed by the orbital overlap between adjacent chromophores. But the the vast majority of singlet fission chromophores that we know of are organic semiconducting materials. And these have significant anisotropy in the way that they pack in the crystal structure. That is, the, their crystal packing in different dimensions is not equal. And so what this can result in is significant anisotropy in the rates of triplet mobility in different 
directions within crystalline organic semiconductors. So as an example, I have a hypothetical crystal structure shown here. And in this direction denoted by the arrow, we might have relatively good pi stacking between adjacent chromophores, which would give us good orbital overlap between these chromophores. This would give us strong electronic couplings and therefore relatively fast triplet exciton diffusion in this direction. However, you can imagine in a different direction, along a different axis of this crystalline material, we might have relatively poor orbital overlap between it chromophores, which would give us weaker electronic couplings and therefore significantly slower triplet exciton diffusion in this direction. Now, this brings me to TIPS pentacene, this molecule here on the left. TIPS pentacene has been extensively studied within the singlet fission field, and it's widely considered to be a model chromophore and a model system for studying intermolecular singlet fission. However, the studies of TIPS pentacene in its crystalline phase that have considered triplet mobility have largely assumed that triplet excitons can move isotropically within this material. That is, they can move equally freely in any direction. And if you look at the crystal structure of TIPS pentacene, this seems unlikely. So in the middle here, we can see that within two dimensions of the material of crystalline TIPS pentacene, we have good pi stacking between adjacent chromophores. And so we would expect relatively fast triplet exciton transfer in these dimensions. And it's also worth noting that the stacking along the A and the B axes are not equal in this material. However, if you look along the third crystallographic axis, the C axis, you can see that the intermolecular separations are mu now much larger and there's no pi contact between molecules in this direction. In fact, they're only contacting each other through these insulating TIPS groups. So we would therefore expect triplet exciton diffusion in this direction to become to be considerably slower than in the other two. So the questions that guided our research in this project were, first of all, how does this significant anisotropy within the crystal packing of TIPS pentacene influence triplet transport within this material? And subsequently to that, if we do discover that there is significant anisotropy within triplet exciton diffusion in this material, how would that affect triplet mobility on the bulk scale in this material, such as in some sort of film you might have in a device? So we want to study crystalline tips pentacene, and we are going to do that by looking at nanoparticles of crystalline tips pentacene. Now, some previous work by our group has shown that if you form nanoparticle dispersions of tips pentacene in water through a method known as reprecipitation, you form nanoparticles that initially have a very disordered or amorphous structure. However, if you then add polyvinyl alcohol to this nanoparticle dispersion, the molecules within these nanoparticles rearrange into a crystalline packing. And you can see this through a change in the steady state absorption spectra of these samples, as I've shown on the right. Now, I don't have a lot of time to get into this process, but I am happy to take questions on it. But we have shown by other experimental methods, such as X-ray diffraction, that these nanoparticles do possess long range crystalline order. So now that we've got our crystalline tips pentacene, we want to study the ultra fast exciton dynamics in these nanoparticles. And so to do this, we're going to use a method known as transient absorption spectroscopy. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with transient absorption, this is an ultra fast laser based technique in which we take our sample and we excite it with some pump laser pulse. And then at some time after that first pulse, we hit our sample with a broadband white light probe pulse. And because this is a broadband pulse, this lets us look at the change in absorption in our sample due to that initial pump pulse over the entire visible spectrum. And so this change in absorption due to the pump pulse can give us an idea of what excited states or transient species might be present in our sample due to this excitation. And we can also change the relative delay time of this pump and this probe pulse by changing the optical delay of the probe. And what this does is it lets us build up a data set of it, this change in absorption in our sample as a function of time. So what we end up with is a two dimensional data set, as I've shown here on the right, where this heat map corresponds to this change in sample absorption. And we can look at this over both wavelength on the X axis and time on the Y axis. Now, trying to wrap your head around two-dimensional data sets can be difficult, so we can slice up this data set in a number of different ways to analyze it more, easy, more easily. First of all, we, consider, we can consider a single delay time of that probe pulse, 
and look at the change in absorption of our sample over the entire visible spectrum. And this is what we call a transient absorption spectrum. And I've shown this on the left here. Alternatively, we can look at a single wavelength and monitor how that change in absorption varies over our delay time window to give us a kinetic trace of, out of our data. And I've shown this on the right. So bearing this in mind, let's have a look at some transient absorption data of our crystalline tips pentacene nanoparticles. And on the left here, I've shown transient absorption spectra of our nanoparticles at a range of different delay times, normalized to this large positive feature at about 520 nanometers. And you can see that the shape of these spectra change quite dramatically over the first 10 to 20 picoseconds or so. And this evolution of the spectra actually, const actually corresponds to the singlet fission process taking place, where our singlet excitons are converting into triplet excitons. And we know from some previous work that this large positive feature centered at 523 nanometers is an excited state absorption from triplet excitons in tips pentasane. So we know that we are forming triplets. But you can see beyond about 50 picoseconds in delay, we don't see any further ch shape change in the spectra. There's no real further evolution of the spectral shape. And that indicates that there's not really any further e evolution of our system beyond these triplet excitons decaying. So beyond 50 picoseconds delay, we can confidently say that we've only got triplet excitons floating around and all they're doing is decaying. So we can monitor the kinetics of this excited state absorption feature to look at the kinetics of triplet excitons. And I've shown this on the right here. And as you can see, if we change our excitation density or our laser um, power, this, can, this excited state absorption chain decays much, much faster. So as we increase our excitation density, as we increase our concentration of excitons in the sample, this decay of our triplets gets much faster. And this suggests that we have some sort of decay process here, which is second order with respect to triplet concentration. And it's probably some sort of triplet-triplet bimolecular annihilation interaction. Now, from this data, we can extract triplet concentrations as a function of time. And to these triplet concentrations, we're going to fit a kinetic model of this form here, where we consider both the first order natural triplet decay and this bimolecular second order decay term corresponding to triplet-triplet annihilation. And this is where we can start to get some information about how our triplet excitons are moving and diffusing within this crystalline material. Because this bimolecular rate coefficient, K2, takes on different mathematical forms depending upon the type of excitonic motion that annihilation is limited by. So we will consider three different models here. We'll look at isotropic three-dimensional exciton diffusion, one-dimensional triplet exciton diffusion, and finally, anisotropic three-dimensional exciton diffusion. So to start with, we will consider a simple model where triplet excitons can move isotropically in the material. And K2 takes this mathematical form where D is the diffusion coefficient of our triplet excitons, and R is what's called the annihilation radius. It's the minimum intermolecular separation you need before two triplet excitons can interact with one another and annihilate. Now, if we try and fit this model to our data, you can see that on the left here that we do get quite a good fit to the data. And if you look at our best fit parameters down at the bottom of the slide, this value of our diffusion coefficient does seem quite reasonable. It's on the order of 10 to the negative six centimeters squared per second, which is in the ballpark for triplet exciton diffusion coefficients in organic semiconductors. But this best fit value of our annihilation radius seems a bit too large. And this is because in tips pentacene, as in many other organic semiconductors, triplet excitons are known to be highly localized upon individual molecules or chromophores. But this best fit value of 2.3 nanometers is much, much larger than any of the intermolecular separations in any dimension of crystalline tips pentacene. And what this suggests to us is that there's possibly some issue here with the kinetic model that we're trying to fit. And actually, as I've tried to foreshadow, this is most likely due to the, this model assuming that we have isotropic diffusion of triplet excitons in all three dimensions, but in a material that is actually highly anisotropic in terms of its structure. So clearly we need to use a different kinetic model here that actually accounts for anisotropy in triplet exciton diffusion. And the first model we'll consider is one 
is an approximation of sorts where you'll consider only one dimensional diffusion of our excitons along with this axis of closest slip stacking, the A axis shown in red here. For one dimensional diffusion, K2 takes on this form where R and D are just one dimensional analogs of the parameters I mentioned earlier, and N is the molecular density. And you can see that if we try and fit this one dimensional model to our data in blue here, we do get a reasonable fit, especially at early times which could suggest that triplet exciton diffusion within our material is largely one dimensional. However, you can see that this fit of our model becomes less good at later times. And if I zoom in, you can see that it starts to underestimate this rate of triplet annihilation at longer times. And this is because in, this, in the mathematical form of this model, T is on the denominator. So as we go to large enough times or long enough delay times, this entire bimolecular term has to reduce to zero. So clearly, while one dimensional diffusion might be a reasonable approximation at earlier times in our system, at longer times, we do actually need to account for some level of diffusion in the slower directions. So to do that, we will consider an anisotropic exciton diffusion model, where K2 has this form here. Now, this is starting to get a bit complex, but the key point to notice is that we're now actually fitting two separate diffusion coefficients. We've got DZ, which is the, this diffusion coefficient for diffusion in the direction of fast motion, and d rho, which is the average diffusion coefficient in all of the slower directions. And you can see that this anisotropic 3D model in green here on the left does fit our data quite well. And our best fit values for these two diffusion coefficients differ by four orders of magnitude, which does suggest that yes, we are seeing some quite considerable anisotropy in triplet exciton diffusion within this material. So if you're squinting at this graph on the left, trying to make out the difference between the one domain, between the isotropic and the anisotropic models, I'll zoom in for you. And you can see that there's actually no difference in the fits between these two models whatsoever. They're identical. And this is actually because both of these models have the same general mathematical form. K2 is equal to some constant A, plus some constant B over the square root of time. So if we're fitting these models to our data, then of course they're both going to fit equally well. But both of these, mo these models correspond to very different physical systems. And so even though we can both get, get them both to fit, not both of them will give us reasonable best fit parameters. And if we choose poorly in which model to fit our data with, that can give us some very misleading predictions and an analysis down the track. So bear that in mind, and I'll get into that in a second. But first of all, I wanna go back to this anisotropic three-dimensional diffusion model. Now we're only fitting two diffusion coefficients here, dz and d rho, but actually we want to look at diffusion along each independent axis of this material. So to do this, we use some constrained density functional theory calculations and Marcus theory to estimate diffusion coefficients along each crystallographic axis. Again, I don't really have time to get into the nitty gritty details of these calculations, but I'm happy to take questions after. But what we wind up with are predicted diffusion coefficients for each crystallographic axis of tips pendosane. I've shown that in the rightmost column here. And you can see that moving from the A axis down to the C axis, we are predicting a change in our diffusion coefficients by over seven orders of magnitude, which is extremely significant here. You can see that our predicted value for diffusion along the A axis agrees relatively well with the value that we fit from our experimental data. They're on the same order of magnitude and they only differ by about a factor of two, which considering the level of DFT theory that we use in these calculations is actually not bad. As I mentioned earlier, we don't have independent measures of the B and C diffusion coefficients from our kinetic modeling, but we do have an average of these. So if we average our predicted diffusion coefficients along the B and C axes, by taking a geometric mean, we again wind up with a predicted diffusion coefficient that is on the same order of magnitude as what we fit to our data. So we are seeing relatively good agreement here between our computational work and our kinetic fits to our experimental data. And what this shows, it's, it confirms that yes, we have some quite significant anisotropy in rates of triplet exciton diffusion between the different axes of crystalline tips pendosine. So what does this mean? Well, we can use these diffusion coefficients to estimate how far triplet excitons can move along each of these crystallographic axes by ca calculating their diffusion lengths. 
And I've shown these here. And you, again, you can see some really significant differences. So along the A-axis, we could have a diffusion length of almost 500 nanometers, of almost half a micron, which is huge. Our diffusion length along the B-axis is smaller, but still quite considerable, nearly 100 nanometers. But our diffusion length for triplet exciton excitons along the C-axis is tiny. It is less than one nanometer. And actually, the intermolecular separation along the C-axis is more than one nanometer in this material. So what this suggests is that there is effectively negligible triplet exciton diffusion in, along the C direction. And on average, triplet exitons will hop less than one intermolecular separation in this direction. Now, going back to this really big um, diffusion length of nearly half a micron along the A axis, this is actually comparable, if not larger, than the average thickness you might get in some sort of crystalline film that we, you would use in a device. And so what this suggests to us is that if you are able to orient a large scale crystalline film of tips pentacene with this A axis pointing in the direction of your desired exciton transport, you should be able to transport nearly all of your triplet exitons towards that interface in whatever device you've got. Now, just finally, I've also listed a diffusion length here for isotropic diffusion. And this is calculating the diffusion length using the, the diffusion coefficient that we fit from our isotropic 3D model that I talked about earlier. Now on the surface, this does seem quite reasonable. A diffusion length of 27 nanometers in an organic semiconductor does seem pretty par for the course. But this is actually incredibly misleading if you compare it to the diffusion lengths along each crystallographic axis here. So along the B and C axes, this isotropic model significantly underestimates how far triplet excitons can move. And in the C direction, it significantly overestimates how far triplet excitons can move in this direction. So therefore, we need to be really careful when trying to fit experimental data with of triplet mobility in anisotropically packed um, organic semiconductor systems. Because we, while we could fit this data with an isotropic diffusion model, the best fit parameters out of this model would give us highly misleading results in the long term. So to conclude this work, we've shown the triplet exciton diffusion in crystalline tips pentacene is extremely anisotropic. We see orders of magnitude difference in diffusion coefficients along different axes. And we can have a potential diffusion length of almost half a micron if we can correctly orient films of this material. And more broadly, we've shown that if you are looking at triplet exciton motion in some sort of crystalline organic semiconductor, you really do need to account for the anisotropy in triplet exciton diffusion in these materials, because you can fit experimental data from these systems with either isotropic or anisotropic models. But not both of both of them won't give you reasonable best fit parameters. And if you choose the incorrect model, this can give you really poor predictions of triplet mobility on the large scale. Finally, to conclude, I want to thank my PhD supervisors, Tack and Dave, who have been great throughout the course of my PhD, particularly with this work. I want to thank the entire Huang and Key research group. This is us um, winning a local Racky quiz night the other year. Uh, I need to thank Mr. Matthew Ball, a lab technician who was really helpful when our laser was misbehaving. And of course, the ARC for funding this research and the Australian government for my research study. And thank you for coming to listen. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I liked the photographic interludes that uh, you, you put through there to kind of break the tension. That was, um, that was excellent. So uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I would like to open up for questions if anyone would like to ask any questions from our speaker. Um, so please just jump in and unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Rowan, it's Paul Byrne here. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. It was, it was well presented and uh, flowed beautifully. Um, I was just curious. Um, so a lot of people have done work on the electron mobility or hole mobility in tits pentacene. And one uh, would imagine that the uh, Dexter mechanism that you've considered would be similar to the hopping mechanism for charges. How does, uh, have you looked to see about the anisotropy of the charge mobility and how that maps onto your um, photophysical measurements? 
I haven't done any research in that regard, but I certainly read the literature there. And you're absolutely right. Charge transport in crystalline tips pentacene is also extremely <coughs> anisotropic. And there have been reports of, I can't give you the exact numbers off the top of my head, but again, orders of magnitude difference. And again, it's this A axis of the material that has shows the fastest transport. It's actually a little interesting. It's this anisotropy in charge mobility has been known within the community for years, but TIPS pendocene is largely studied in the context of field effect transistors. Mm -hmm. So it looks like there's been, you know, some miscommunication or non-communication between the, you know, the, the individual research communities, because it's been well known for five to 10 years in the field effect transistor research field, but really it hasn't been considered at all in the single fission field, despite the mm -hmm. fact that we're looking at the same material. Yeah, that's very true. And it's often the case where different areas sort of all go to their particular sessions, but they don't always necessarily mm. listen to each other. Hence so, the importance uh, of communities like this. <coughs> Absolutely. Okay, thanks very much. No worries. All right. Um, do we have any other quick questions from the audience? Uh, if not, I think we, we're kind of running short on time, so we will um, call it there then. Uh, everyone, please join me in thanking Rohan one more time. Yeah, that was, uh, was a very good presentation.